All right, let's go ahead and get started. This, uh, I still haven't received any requests of stuff that you want to hear about, and so I'm just going to keep picking. And this week, I chose what I am most passionate about, um, which is the idea of mobility. And mobility is something that, you know, prior to maybe a decade ago, we looked at flexibility and mobility as ultimately the same thing. But with, with new science in the, the fascia system and the musculoskeletal systems, um, a lot is coming to light. And so we're going to talk today a lot about flexibility and mobility, um, how they're the same and where they cross paths. But this is what I am most passionate about. First off, though, does anyone know the difference between these two words, flexibility and mobility? Mobility is, is just being able to move, in my mind. But flexibility is, is being able to bend and, you know, okay. different, different cool. positions. So. All right. That's, that's great. I thought of my computer. I was going to switch the slide there. Let me see. Perfect. Why did you get these three All right. So, um, I want to start by talking about all of the components of fitness because it's important to see where flexibility is in relationship to the other components that we sometimes give more attention to and focus more on. So the components of fitness are cardiorespiratory endurance, muscular strength and endurance. And sometimes those, depending on who you're talking to, those are separate. Cardio or muscular strength is one component and muscular endurance is one. But for our discussion, we're gonna combine them. Um, flexibility and then Body composition. Body composition is um, our fat to muscle ratio. And so we will see changes in our body composition as we adopt the other components of fitness. There's nothing that we specifically target to, to focus on body composition. Uh, but then we have motor related components as well. And motor related components are things like balance and coordination, reaction time, agility, all of those types of things that make it easier to move. And so when we look at this, you know, these are also, these motor related components are also going to be enhanced as we implement um, the other three, a system of those other three components. And so really when we're putting together a movement or an exercise based program, we're focusing on cardio, strength, and flexibility. Those are the three kind of benchmarks that we try to incorporate into a movement practice. Now, traditionally, what is the generally accepted rule of which one of those is gonna be the most important for longevity? Cardio. Cardio, right? We've heard all our whole lives, cardio, cardio, cardio is the key to, to health. Um, and usually, muscular strength is number two, and if flexibility is even considered at all, it's usually a distant third. Um, and, and I grew up believing this. I, I, even, even when I got my bachelor's degree in exercise science, my focus was on, you know, the more I can do, the better results are going to be, right? The more cardio I get in, the better my aerobic base is gonna be and the better my performance is gonna be. Or the more strength or the more weight I lift, the more strength I'm going to gain and, and all of these things. Um, and I didn't really even pay attention to flexibility as a result. I grew up as a runner and until the age of about 25, I couldn't even touch my toes. My hamstrings were so tight. And so um, generally accepted is that cardio is most important. But um, my contention is that maybe, maybe those that order of priority needs to be reversed. And people all often look at me like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But I want to talk about why I believe that, and maybe not reverse, because I don't want to delegitimize the role of cardio or strength into our movement program. But I do want to increase um, the awareness and the importance of flexibility to be in line with those other components. And so the first, the first reason why I think that flexibility should be ranked higher in our, our priority is that if we have good flexibility, if we can move our bodies to their full range of motion without pain or injury, then it's going to enhance 
what we can do for our cardio and it's going to enhance what we can do for our strength, right? Everyone in here has probably had an injury at some point that has limited their range of motion and has therefore limited what they can do for strength and cardio. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum, it's also true. If I don't have, um, I can't remember which one I said first. So if I have good flexibility, it's going to enhance what I can do. If I've got poor flexibility, it's going to actually increase my risk of injury and it's going to make it so I can't go as far for my cardio. I can't do as much um, for strength training. I can't move through a, a wide range of motion. So that's the first reason is it's flexibility is either going to enhance or hinder our progress as we move toward our, our, our wellness. All right. The second thing to consider is the intention of why we're doing it in the first place. You know, when we ask ourselves why we're exercising, why we're moving, why we're eating the way we are, um, that answer is going to be different for every single person. But those whys that we work through throughout our, our lives are traditionally tied to using our bodies in ways that we used to be able to use them and no longer can and are now limited. Um, more so than being able to deadlift your body weight or run a six minute mile, right? We're, we typically have our whys based more as adults and especially as we age, the importance factor is more about living a high quality life, being able to use the body um, in the ways that we want to, when we want to. And then the last reason why um, I think that this needs to be considered more is that a lot of the emerging science is uh, coming to light that in regard to exercise, most people exercise for body composition related goals, to lose weight or to increase muscle mass. And for whatever that reason means, whatever, if it's aesthetics or if it's that they believe that's going to make them feel better, whatever it is, that's been the focus. But all of the emerging science is showing that our body composition, the amount of fat that we have in our body, and our ability to burn fat is almost exclusively nutrition based. It's almost all food. In fact, you'll hear a lot of the times people use the 80-20 ratio. They say, when we talk about our weight loss or body composition goals, 80% of the results come from the food that we eat, put in our body. Only 20% of the results come from what we put in the gym. So, if, <laughs> Siri's responding to me as I'm talking up here. She answered. <laughs> um, so, 80%, and I think it's even higher than that, because it's only 80%, or exercise is only 20% if we're eating with intention, even if we're eating the right things for our body and for our goals, then exercise plays a role. But if we're eating garbage, it's impossible to out-exercise a bad diet. Maybe we shouldn't have this right after the brunch, right? But, <laughs> but I don't know if you've heard that 80-20 rule or you can't out-exercise a bad diet. This is why. Um, and so regardless of how we prioritize our cardio, strength, and flexibility, it's only 20% of the equation of why most people are moving their body. And so we want to dig a little bit deeper into how we can incorporate more flexibility training into our daily lives so that we feel better. Um, there are lots of different types of flexibility training. And I would guess that most people in this room have done maybe two to four of these. And some of them might not even know what they are. All right, the first one is the one that is the most common and the most familiar to people, and that is static stretching. Static stretching is where you, you take a, uh, a certain joint and you pull it and you hold that uh, range of motion when you feel that pull for anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds. And that's what static stretching is. That is the most common stretching technique, but it's also perhaps the most or the least effective. It's the one that we've been doing our whole lives, but it um, doesn't produce what we think it does. And that's because our emerging science is showing that most of the focus is on um, these sensory receptors in our muscles called muscle spindles. 
So if, if, if my fingers represent a bundle of muscle tissue, each one of those individual muscle fibers has this spring-like mechanism called a muscle spindle. And it sends feedback to the brain. And so as the muscle is lengthening, those muscle spindles are sending a message to the brain saying, the muscle's getting long, we need to pull it back into place. And so we're actually, our brain is fighting what we're actually trying to accomplish. And so as soon as we're done stretching, even though it feels good, uh, within 20 or 30 minutes, our muscles typically are going to go right back to the length that they were prior to the static stretching. Now, ballistic stretching is when we, um, actually let's talk about dynamic stretching first. I should have put those opposite. No, we'll talk about ballistic first. Ballistic stretching is when we use momentum and speed. So if I'm trying to, let's say, uh, statically stretch my, my chest, one exercise to statically stretch your chest is this, and if I wanna stretch my shoulders, I could static stretch here and hold this, right? A ballistic version of those two stretches would be doing these arm flappy things, right? Where we add momentum and speed now, what would be a concern when we're talking about ballistic stretching versus static stretching? Overdoing it. What's that? Overdoing it. Overdoing it or, you know, kicking your leg and not being warmed up or ready and, and end up hurting yourself more than actually assisting. So with ballistic stretching, it's important to not do that before your muscles are warm. You know, think, your mu think about your muscles as a sponge, right? You, some of you have cleaned the pool with the sponges, right? Those sponges, when they're dry, they are crunchy. And if you went to try to bend or tear one of those sponges, it would likely break. But you saturate it in water and all of a sudden it becomes very pliable and workable. And our muscles are very similar when we're working them, especially when we're working flexibility and mobility. So ballistic can be more beneficial than static, but only if we're warmed up. Now dynamic is Kind of the combination of those two. It's moving the muscles through the range of motion. So it adds a movement component to the range of motion. And so where ballistic might be using momentum, dynamic stretching would be doing those same exercises but under control in both ranges of motion. Um, and so that's what dynamic is. And so we could think of, you know, things like yoga would be more of a dynamic uh, stretching or flexibility practice. Um, PNF is one of my favorite acronyms ever, and I'm not going to make you remember it, um, but it's fun to say. It stands for Proprioceptive Neuromuscular Facilitation, <laughs> and that is, a, um, that is a long word that describes a relatively simple, simple process, but this is where we contract the opposite muscle that is being stretched, right? So if, Imagine, for example, if I'm laying on my back and I have my foot in a yoga strap and I'm stretching my hamstring, meaning I'm, I'm pulling it up like this. When I get to the end of that hamstring range of motion, it feels really, really tight, right? If we change our focus and then contract the quadricep, the muscle on the front of the thigh at the same time, most people are very, very surprised to be able to get an additional three to four inches of movement just by stretching that opposite muscle. It overrides the tension response in the muscle that we're stretching. So PNF is a really effective way of increasing our range of motion and flexibility. However, it does require a greater knowledge of anatomy. And a lot of the times um, you have to have a partner who is trained and can help with those uh, ranges of motion because not all, of, uh, not all the muscles in the body are as specific as what we just mentioned, the, the quad and the hamstring. So that's what this one is. Now, this one here, these next two are my favorite. And these are more mobility practices than flexibility. And we're gonna talk about the differences of those in just a second. But this stands for myofascial release or self myofascial release. And this is a process in which we add pressure to the muscles and the pressure itself it releases tension in the fascia and in the muscles. Okay, so you think about like trigger point therapy or release where you've gone to the massage and 
maybe you have a knot and the massage therapist holds pressure on that and it, and it releases. That would be myofascial release. Self-myofascial release is doing the same thing with, with an implement, something like a, a foam roller um, or a lacrosse ball is my favorite tool, a little rubber, um, a little rubber ball that you can place there and add movement. But self-myofascial release and myofascial release are extremely effective and more long-term than all of the ones uh, above that. The next one requires more knowledge and, and we're not gonna spend a ton of time talking about it because it, uh, unless we have like a 90 minute mobility class and we have all the equipment, we're not gonna be able to facilitate it unless we do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But this is where we use a process called distraction. And distraction is where we are pulling the joint or the, the bone that is the head of the joint from the socket of the joint and then adding some movement. All right, so let's say our shoulder joint is here, our glenohumeral joint. The top of the humerus, the end of it is a ball like this, and it articulates with the, the scapula, okay? And so it's moving all over, but if there's a ton of pressure in here, I don't have as much range of motion. It's really hard and it gets stuck. We see this in a lot with like things like frozen shoulder um, and things like that, where it's, it's a, a tension thing with the, the capsule of the joint. So distraction is a process where you use rubber bands typically, or another person that's trained to help release that, where you can pull um, the head of the, the, the bone away from its articulating surface to get more movement. And so I wish I would have had something that I could have anchored a band to in here. But if I was talking about distraction of the shoulder joint, I would put the band in my wrist. Okay, and it would anchor the other end of the band to something stationary, and then I would step back, and that rubber band then pulls my shoulder away from that, and it allows me to then add some rotation and get some other movements that I normally wouldn't uh, be able to do. And sometimes you can combine these, that's why it says and or pressure. You can add myofascial release to distraction to compound the benefit um, in that process. Uh, vibration so training. A question on that. Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever seen an air do that where the, the bands where you can pull back and... and, and the kinesis machine yeah. in the gym? Potentially, it would be limited on your grip strength. I mean, you'd have to, you would have to set the weight heavy enough that it's not going, that you can pull it a little bit, that you can, it's got a little bit of give. Yeah. Um, but uh, not so much that you're falling yeah, over right, when you right, right. pull back. But yeah, you could potentially use um, something yeah, stationary like that. You just do want something that has a little bit of give. You can't yeah. use something like a, a TRX or a yoga strap because there, it's stationary and it has no That's elasticity. Um, vibration training is something that is relatively new. Um, the first time I heard about this was when I was actually at school for my master's degree in human movement biomechanics. And I thought when I saw the professor bring in this little platform that shakes, I thought, okay, now we've lost all credit of science and now we've got the snake oil salesman coming out with this because I saw this little thing that vibrates the same as those machines from the, the 50s that you stood on and had the belt around and they're supposed to shake you. Um, but I, I was like, what's the research on this? And he, he brought me up and he said, what is your tightest muscle group? And of course it was the hamstrings. And so he said, go ahead and try to, to touch your toes. And at the time I went down and maybe was six to eight inches away from touching my toes. And he's like, okay, now jump back up. And he turned this machine on and it feels kind of weird. But he's like, okay, now go ahead and try to touch your toes. And I, I went back down just past where I was right before that. But as he turned up the frequency, he turned up the hertz of how fast I was vibrating, consistent with as he was turning up, I found the muscles releasing. And I was able to go all the way down and not only touch my toes, but put my hands all the way underneath my feet. 
My flexibility didn't increase all of a sudden in 30 seconds, the ability to move almost eight to 10 inches. It was because the vibration throws off those sensory receptors around the muscle and allows more depth. Very similar to the way that myofascial release does. And so um, initially they were just the platforms and they sold a lot of them, but there was a lot of good ones and there was a lot of crappy ones and people would have their opinions. Um, but now more frequent than anything is the, the guns, the vibration guns. And I don't know if you've seen those before. It looks like a little power tool and on the end it has this little oscillating head and usually you can change the heads out. I have one, I should have brought it in. Um, but you turn it on and use it for trigger point release and you can add it with movement and it is incredible at increasing flexibility. And then lastly, we well, have... Question on it. Is, yeah. there, is there a chance of tearing the muscle then because you, you stretch it too far? No. I mean, you're not, move, you're not doing a lot of stretching with the gun. It's more, of a, it's more like massage. You lay, lay there and you let the, the muscle hit. And this will make more sense when we talk about mobility here in just a second, what, yeah. what, what the difference is. What about when you said you extended six to eight inches more when you went down to touch your toes? That sounds like a pretty, you know. Are you gonna be on a higher risk of yeah. muscles? Well, if the muscles were not able to lengthen, it would tear. But what it did, the muscles are very elastic. They're very pliable. Uh, they're, it's limited not by the muscle itself, but by the fascia that encases it. Each muscle fiber, and this is something that's relatively new too, we have always kind of thought that, you know, we've got these muscles, and on each end of the muscle, they're attached to a bone by a tendon, right? And so, like, like um, our, let's say our calves, our calves are attached via the Achilles tendon to the heel on the bottom, and then they come up and they cross the back of the knee and attach to the back of the femur. And on each end of those, there are tendons. And so we think that when we stretch the calves out, we're stretching the muscle tissue that's between those two tendons. But now we know that that connective tissue, that tendon tissue actually travels the whole length of the muscle. And every single muscle fiber is wrapped in these sacs of fascia. And so they get sticky and they stick together. I don't know if you've ever prepared chicken. Um, sometimes you can see the fascia. It's like, like this really paper thin, just kind of very tough fibrous tissue that usually you wanna get rid of before you're gonna eat it. But we have that in our muscles as well. And usually our flexibility limitations are more tied to the, uh, the stickiness of the fascia than they are the elasticity of the muscle themselves. Does any of this stuff change as you age this? I mean, does it get more brittle or, or you know? If, if you don't work on it, yeah. If you don't, but the body has the potential to continue to operate the same as it does throughout life. I know, I know people that are doing yoga into their 80s. They can do their they can do the splits and go into a handstand and do all this crazy stuff with, with incredible flexibility. Um, and a lot of times we use that as a, not as a crutch, but we've been told our whole lives that as we get older, we're gonna lose aerobic capacity one beat per minute. We're gonna lose muscle strength potential 1% every year of life. And that's true. Those are quantitative facts. But what we don't talk about is that no one in their lives ever uses 100% potential. So even though as we age, the potential decreases, we still have a lot of room for growth as we, as we get to those, those endpoints. Um, and then the last type of flexibility training is something like yoga or Pilates, which is a movement practice that ties all of those things together. Um, and I used to think that yoga was a complete waste of time. <laughs> I did, I thought that if I wanted to get in shape, it was cardio, it was strength, um, and yoga was laying and taking a nap and stretching out for an hour and a half, and what could that possibly do? And now it's probably the most consistent part of my daily practice and habits in all areas, not just movement and fitness. Um, but you can you can uh, accomplish a lot through through doing those types of movements too. Was there a question on, on yeah. the statics and ballistic in there? If you're using weights, 
that enhance that then, like we do with the water? Um, does the you're, you're moving and you have to have the weights now? So is that are you getting a double benefit from that basically? Yes, if you're working through the full range of motion. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the um, because Pilates, for example, is like it, the purest form of dynamic stretching. You're consciously extending, lengthening, and you'll you hear hear those words when you go to yoga and Pilates classes to, to lengthen. And sometimes you think I'm fully lengthened, and you get one more inch, and you feel it completely in a different spot. And so, it takes a lot of practice to kind of get to know how our bodies move and where we're going to get the most benefit from uh, the different practices. And then, let's see here. All right. Now I want to talk about the difference between these two words. Um, so flexibility, by definition, is the ability of the joint to move through its full range of motion. All right. Mobility, therefore, is kind of exactly what Eric said. It's, it's the functional application of flexibility. It's actually using the flexibility for movement. And most of us have thought that, um, that they're the same thing. So when we hear flexibility, we think mobility. We're stretching because we think it's going to enhance our movement practices. But um, the limitations or the things that limit our flexibility are different than the things that limit our mobility. So who could think of a factor that might contribute to poor flexibility? Just the ability to move a joint through its full range of motion. Laziness. Laziness. <laughs> Something phys physiolog physiological. So things like the ends of the bone, right? That's what the, the bones are formed in a certain way for movement. And so our elbow, the point of our elbow is there so that as we extend our arm, it stops. It hits this bone of the upper arm and it doesn't prevent. If, the, if we didn't have the end of the elbow here, our elbow would just continue to hyperextend all the way. So the ends of the bones are one factor that contributes to flexibility. Also, the amount of muscle or fat around a joint prevents flexibility sometimes. If I have, if, if I am a person that has um, a high body fat percentage, and I have a large stomach and large legs, and I go to stretch my hamstrings, I might have great flexibility in my hamstrings, but I might not be able to reach that full extension because there's a physical barrier preventing me from getting to that full range of motion. Roger's laughing at me. You don't know that I have been there. I don't know if that's why you're laughing, but I've been as much as 85 pounds heavier than I am at this point in my life. But uh, that's a story for another time, I think. So we have lots of these things that contribute to poor flexibility. Also, the length of the muscles, the tension of the muscles, how much we move, all those things compound for flexibility. Now, mobility um, is more tied to the way that our bodies create movement. Um, and it's more applicable. So if we want to generate um, movement in our body, two things have to happen. So let's look back at the elbow because it's, a, it's an easy example. If I want to bend my elbow, the bicep, this muscle on the top, has to contract, which means the muscle fiber is gonna become shorter, and as that happens, it's gonna pull the lever of the lower arm up into this flexion state, okay? But at the same time that that muscle was contracting, the triceps on the back of the arm have to lengthen to allow the movement, right? If I have super tight triceps, I'm not gonna be able to fully flex my elbow. And then vice versa, if I wanna open it up, tricep shortens, bicep lengthens. And all throughout our body, we have muscles working in coordination with, with each other through this length tension relationship. Right? We have our, our pectoralis and our rhomboids and our traps. We have our abs and our erector muscles, our hip flexors and our glutes, quads, hamstrings, anterior tibialis, uh, gastrocnemius. All of them work in this. Now, in a perfect environment, um, 
where we were on our feet most of the time and actively moving our joints through a full range of motion, we wouldn't have mobility problems, flexibility problems, pain problems, injuries. But as the human species has evolved, everything today is generated and created to make things easier for us. Right? Everything. And so we might spend 90% of our day in a seated position. Okay, so if I spend, I wish I had a chair, if I spend most of my day with my hip at 90 degrees, what do you think is going to happen to the muscle that causes that to come up? Yeah, and, and it's going to atrophy and it's going to feel like I don't need to strengthen because it's, I'm always in this state. This is my now my new operating range of motion. And so that's why, you know, we, um, and so as a result, what happens is that they get super tight and the hip flexors start to pull the pelvis forward. So it anteriorly rotates the pelvis, causing tightness in the front of the hips and causing low back pain. Because now my glutes are weak because I never stand up. My hip flexors are tight and now I've got back pain, I've got knee pain, and it's all stemming from this hip position that we've allowed ourselves to get into. So the more sedentary we become, the more immobile and out of balance we become. Yeah. How do you relate that to as you get older that you get like this? Same thing. In fact, it's it's uh, like the, they call it the um, oh, what's the name of the book? One of my uh, people that I look to a lot for mobility information has written a couple of books. Oh, it's called Desk Bound. Um, it's a mobility book that talks about how the standard American's position, worker's position, is in a seated position with the shoulders forward because we're at a desk, we're driving, and so, yeah, the pectorals become tight and overactive, and the back muscles become weak and underactive, allowing that, and so this becomes the normal range of motion, right? If we use a walker, okay, the first time we use a walker, walkers are designed to give you balance standing upright, but the more we use them, the more we rely on them, what happens, right? And so we, we get to the point where we might be fully flexed at the hips using the walker like this. It's not because we've all of a sudden lost the flexibility and the ability to move. It's that the muscles are now acting like a parking brake, preventing us from fully opening the hips up, all right? So... You know, I don't know if you've ever stood up after sitting down for a long period of time, you kind of get a stabbing sensation right in the front of the hips, and you're, oh, and then you kind of take a second to open them all up, right? Did you have a question? Well, don't you think uh, the expression, I couch potato. Yes, that couch potato. Very quickly. Yes, and that's, that's, the, that's the whole idea. And so we look at society, we look at the way everything is, is uh, we used to not have to worry about this because just the act of living and taking care of ourselves required a lot of movement and function. But now, I can wake up in the morning, roll out of bed, make breakfast, drive in my car to work, ride an elevator up to an office, sit in an office for eight hours where I drive, and then I drive home and I sit in front of the TV. That's a normal day for a lot of the population. I just read a couple of days ago that um, obesity has tripled. Obe obesity has tripled in just two decades, I think it was. The last 20 years, we more than tripled obesity. It's a huge epidemic that we don't pay attention to. Well, we pay attention to it, but we're approaching it from the wrong direction. And, we, and people are using that as a reason to sell products and services and gym memberships and all this rather than focusing on the actual core of what's going to matter. And so because flexibility and mobility are different, the approaches to both have to be different too. And so typically a mobility practice will be the combination of releasing overactive and tight muscles and strengthening the... Um, the underactive and weaker muscles to bring the body back into alignment. And it is not something, you know, mobility is not permanent. 
Our body is very, very pliable. And you know, we heard about muscle memory our whole life. And we typically, we use that in terms of things like riding a bike. It's like riding a bike, you never forget. But it also is specific to this idea of mobility, right? When we were kids, went to school, recess, playing around, right? Why do we stop that? Right? Why do we not have recess in high school or why don't we have recess here? When was the last time you hung by your arms from rings and flipped yourself upside down? And But our bodies no. are, are able to return to some of those things that we do. Um, and so ultimately, it just has to be a specific, dedicated practice. And so recommendations for flexibility and mobility include, um, I believe, conscious intentional flexibility mobility practice every single day even if it's just stretching in bed before you get out of the bed in the morning and, and before you go to sleep at night laying on your back stretching the back hips um, those types of things every day and this is this is you know these recommendations would be similar if we we're talking about cardio we've heard that you need to do cardio five or more days a week you know, 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate, maintaining that to increase aerobic function, and you know, strength training recommendations are hit each muscle group um, two to three times a week. Then you're going to do two to three sets of eight to 12 reps, depending on what your goals are. So, typically, flexibility recommendations are stretch a few minutes before a workout or after a workout, and then that's all we need to work worry about. But ultimately, every day we should be focused on increasing our range of motion, doing something that's dedicated to moving our body. Um, the other thing is that it all counts. A lot of times we think, oh, if I can't do 20 minutes, if I can't get to the gym for 20 minutes to walk, it's not worth it, so I'm not going to do anything. And the same goes to say for stretching. People think if I can't do it, then it's not worth it. But everything counts. Um, and this will make more sense next week when we talk about exercise prescription, um, unless someone else has a suggestion before next week. But uh, a lot of times people see me and they'll comment because I move weird and I'm always stretching. I'm always standing and pulling one leg up or I'll be at a, at a desk and have my leg up on the desk and I actively am trying to, to work on flexibility throughout the day, and it all increases and, and compounds throughout the day. And that not, is not only specific to flexibility, but also specific to, to cardio and strength training as well. We'll talk about that next time. Um, and then it's also important to have some variability in our flexibility practice to switch it up a little bit, not always use the exact same stretches on the exact same muscles in the exact same way. Trying new things, trying the lacrosse ball myofascial release, trying, a, trying the vibration gun, trying the distraction with rotation. And I am trying to get more of that type of work um, into some of the class schedules because for me, in my career as a trainer, the last 20 years, the most results that I have seen in clients that I have worked with are not weight loss and strength. The quality of life and mobility results are the ones that I like to see the most of. And so I want to see more of that because I think it has potentially more benefit than a lot of the other classes, but we just don't know about it. And so this is the first kind of introduction to try to, to get more of that stuff out there. But, um, and then this last one we already talked about, Bodies are adaptive to muscle memory. And so once you start the practice, it gets easier and it gets easier and easier. The first couple of times you start something new, you feel awkward, you feel clumsy, it might be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but the more that we implement different approaches to increasing our flexibility, our mobility is gonna be better, we're gonna be happier, we're gonna feel better, we're gonna have less injuries, less tension. Uh, across the board and that's going to serve as the foundation because then we can utilize those increases in our flexibility to get more out of our strength and our cardio programs that's all any questions yeah roger
when you lost 85 pounds? Uh-huh. Was it due to this 80-20 diet and exercise? Or what it, was, it was due to a complete shift in, in uh, my mindset. It was just, it was, perhaps, I'll, I'll, I'll share that story next week. We'll, we'll go over, it was, it was, um, it was not specific to diet or exercise. It was completely unconscious, the weight coming off, and it was unconscious, or putting it on, and it was unconscious coming off. I was never focused on gaining weight or losing weight. It happened as a, as a byproduct of the way I was living at the time. Yeah. Jack. Yes. I had to have surgery on the tendon link thing. Either that or I had to have a wedge or a, a orthopedic shoe. Uh, you know, with a wedge on it, which I didn't want to have. And it was because I couldn't use the leg and the tendon shrunk and it got tight and it tight. There was no way I could put my heel down. I couldn't walk. Uh, I was walking on my tiptoe on that one. Just because it was so tight. It's a perfect example of the of something external shortening the muscle and preventing full extension and kind of locking it into place. And unfortunately you had to have it surgically repaired. Well, it was just one of those things. I was sixty years old before my the back of that one leg, the knee part would sit on uh, the mattress. It was always half bent. What was the catalyst of that happening? Of it shortening? Well that you couldn't use it? Oh, that's right. And I that's had right. Pre uh, press up uh, my armpit, turn down both legs. Yeah. You know, for quite a while. And yeah. my right leg came out of it faster than the left one. So yeah. the tendon shrunk. Yeah, absolutely. In the, yeah, in the, in the, in the case of something like polio, yeah. there's not a lot you can do. And so you do what you can, and it's great that they were able to, to free it up a little bit, but um, you probably still have limitations that you're dealing with today. Absolutely. But anyway, you do the best you can, but it is important to keep going. Absolutely. Going. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate it. Any other questions? All right. Well, that's it then. Have a good rest of the day. Unless I see some of you at 2 o'clock in here for cardio drumming or at 3 o'clock in here for Mind Reset. That's the rest of the, the schedule over here. <laughs>